In this problem, we're going to prove that xi of x can always be taken to be real, so there will be no imaginary component. And then we can do that by first considering the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So that for a time-independent Schrodinger equation, let's say for the energy level E, we have the solution xi of x. And then we can show that the conjugate of xi of x is also a solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation for energy level E. And then we, can, we know that because we can take this expression and then we can take the conjugate of both sides. And after we take the conjugate at both sides, you can see that the conjugate of xi of x also satisfies the time-independent Schrodinger equation for energy level E. So if xi of x is a solution, then the conjugate is also a solution. So this is one fact that we need to know. So the other thing that we need to show in order to uh, arrive at our conclusion over here is that let's just say we have a solution to the time independent Schrodinger equation xi of 1 and then we also have another solution xi 2 and both of these will satisfy the time independent Schrodinger equation so both of these if you plug it into the time independent Schrodinger equation it will give you e some energy level times xi 1 and the same goes for Xi2. So I can substitute Xi2 into the time independent Schrodinger equation and it will also give me E times Xi2. So if both of these are solutions to the time independent Schrodinger equation, I'm going to define another uh, Xi of 3. And then this Xi of 3 is going to be some constant times Xi of 1 plus some constant times Xi of 2. And then now I'm going to prove that if Xi1 and Xi2 are solutions to the time independent Schrodinger equation, then xi of 3, defined in such a way, must also be a solution to the time independent Schrodinger equation. So we can do that by considering the left hand side of the time independent Schrodinger equation. So if this, so if xi of 3 does indeed satisfy the time independent Schrodinger equation, we would expect the right hand side to be equal to e times xi of 3. But we don't know if this is true yet. We don't know if xi of 3 will indeed satisfy the Schrodinger equation yet. So we're going to start from here and see if we can arrive at the conclusion that this is equal to e times xi3. So the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to substitute in the alternative expression for xi3, which is some constant times xi1 plus some constant times xi2, so the linear combination of xi1 and xi2. And we just substitute in the alternative expression again. And then I'm going to group up the same the terms that have a C1 attached to them. So you can see that this is a second derivative applied to a constant. I can just pull this constant out. So I have C1, and it will be multiplied to all these terms. And then I'm also going to pull this term out. So V times xi1. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to pull the C2 out and group up all the terms that have a C2 attached to them. And so this is what we get, so the potential times xi2. And then we know that by definition, xi1 and xi2, uh, this expression must be equal to e times xi1. So this whole expression is actually equal to e times xi1. And then this expression, you can see that it's actually just this expression, which is equal to e times xi2. So this is equal to e times xi2. So you can see that we have c1 times e times xi1 plus c2 times e times xi2. So what that means is that we have e times c1 times xi1 plus c2 times xi2. And this, by definition, is equal to xi3. So we have e times xi3. So now we have proven that if xi1 and xi2 are solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation, then if you express xi3 in such a form, then this will also be a solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation because of our workings over here. So now it brings, this brings us back to the original uh, problem. So if I have a xi of x, and then we know that it satisfies the time-independent Schrodinger equation, and now we know that the conjugate also satisfies the Schrodinger equation, now we know that a linear combination of these two, uh, of xi and the conjugate, must also satisfy the Schrodinger equation. So you can kind of treat this as our xi1, and you can treat this as our xi2. So this is the same as the xi1 and xi2 that we had in our example over here. And so if this is true, then we know that any linear combination of these two uh, functions 
must also be a solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So I'm just going to... Uh, so this is what we had before in our previous proof, and then I'm going to substitute in the expressions here, the xi original xi of x and the conjugate of xi of x. So we know that this must also be a solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation. And then we're free to choose whatever c1 and c2 should be. And then here the problem uh, kind of suggests us to choose c1 and c2 to be 1. So if I choose c1 and c2 to be 1, we know that xi3 can be equal to xi plus the conjugate of xi. And then we know that from this, we know that this will also be a solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation. And you can see that this is xi of x, this is the conjugate. If you add a function with its conjugate, then the imaginary part just cancels out. So this entire thing is uh, entirely real. There are no imaginary components. So now you can see that for energy level E, we can construct a solution that only has a real part. There are no imaginary components. And another way we can do this is by using this expression here. So we can also define this as i times xi minus the conjugate. So if you have the function and you minus the conjugate, then it takes away the real component, and only the imaginary component is left. And then if you take the imaginary component, you multiply it by i, it takes away the imaginary number. So this entire thing is also real. So using this method, you can also construct a, a solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation that is also that also only has real components. And so there we have it. We have proved what we set out to prove for this problem.